Talking Landscape Photography with Christian Fletcher and Carwin. It is Light Minded with uh, Christian Fletcher and myself, Carwin. And I have to say, we're very excited to be joined by a person, uh, according to photoblog.com, is in the top 25 landscape photographers in the world. She studied at Berkeley in California and runs a, um, a well, runs successful landscape photography workshops in Europe. Currently, she works out of Europe, but Erin Babnick is a Californian. She's uh, with us on the podcast. Erin, welcome to Light Minded. Thanks, Carwin. It's a pleasure to be here. Hey, hi, Erin. Hello. How are you? Uh, I'm actually doing really well. Enjoying having a little time between workshops to get some writing done and work on some new photographs, uh, both things that I haven't had much opportunity to do in recent months. So it's a, it's a pretty nice time for me to concentrate on output for a change. Now, I had a quick chat with you last night. Um, sorry to get straight into it. But did I hear correctly, you've never been to Australia? I have never been to Australia. I've been I've been invited many times. It just has not, the, the stars have not aligned yet, but I, I reckon it will happen eventually. Yeah, well, there's a long way away from from everywhere and especially as we were saying earlier, you know, if you, if you come to Perth, uh, it's the most isolated city and in the world, and um, if you come down to my neck of the woods, it's it's 300 k south of that. So, yeah, you are looking at a a, a very long long journey to get here. And um, I, I noticed with a lot of your photography, you, you you love the mountains and hanging out in those sort of places. And we don't have that over here. I'm af- I'm afraid it's all relatively flat. We got deserts, and yeah, uh, a few other I love pieces, deserts. But, yeah, another yeah, one of my usual stomping ground. Yeah, you like um, Death Valley. I've, I've noticed quite a few photos from there. And, um, Absolutely. Yeah, but um, yeah, we're, we're pretty flat over here. So, yeah. Well, you said so, one of the magic words there is isolation. I love remoteness. Mm, so, yeah. that right there is probably reason enough to come. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. Well, it, there's plenty of places where you can get a unique individual photograph here in Australia because there's places that one you can't get to unless you go in a helicopter or a boat. And two, there's just nothing there to photograph anyway. So if you do photograph it, you'll be the first one to photograph nothing. <laughs> any of that. Yeah. Now, just touching on isolation, you started photographing the Dolomites in Italy about 10 years ago before it was a hotspot. Why there? Um, it was serendipity to some extent. Uh, I was already spending a lot of time in Central Europe and the Dolomites were reasonably close. I was surprised actually to find out that there were such mountains in Italy back Mm. then because this was before the days of social media and I had no exposure um, really to that region. And when I discovered that there were mountains, um, I said, well, let's go and have a look. I didn't know what I was looking for or what to expect. I'd seen some valley photos of the Dolomites. That's what was sort of the norm back then and some of the climbers photos, Mm. um, which weren't supposed to be serious photography, of course. Uh, so I just bought a bunch of topographical maps, did a few exploratory trips and extrapolated from what I learned just with my boots on the ground to what I could see in the maps, bought more maps and just <laughs> took it from there. Uh, so it was basically just a big process of exploration and curiosity, I guess. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so so I guess we should get back to the to the start and and, and ask, you know, who is Aaron Barbic? Absolutely. It's it, Barbic, sorry. It's, you know... Um, you know, give us your your history. I, I know that you're a, you're a, uh, an art historian, and but we'd love to know your history. So, can you enlighten everyone in Australia on, on who you are and where you're from and what you've done and and all these other bits and pieces? Yeah, um, uh, immersion in the arts has really been the one constant in my entire adult life. I was um, a graphic designer at one point. Um, my first real love of creating art was oil painting but then I got into graphic design as a way of making a living and through that I felt that I needed more sort of food for thought to really improve my grasp of what I was doing conceptually and and just in all also in just technique and everything so I want I went to art school um, for a while and there was exposed to art history and uh, was completely uh, smitten. <laughs> and so I absconded <laughs> into the world of art history for a while, actually, um, all the way through BAMA, PhD. I just completely gave up on art school, transferred over to UC Berkeley um, and took that up. And and as these things go, <laughs> in turn discovered photography. <laughs> because yeah, yeah, right. <clears throat> although I had studied it. What's that? Yeah. 
you've done all the hard things and then you've discovered that photography is much more fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, sort of, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it became, you know, it was a tool at first for um, creating an archive of photos for teaching and research. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was pretty fun. It got me out of those dusty underground libraries and, and yeah, back out into yeah. nature, which was something I'd always enjoyed um, before. Yeah. And uh, it just enabled me to pull together everything that I really enjoyed doing. And even, um, you know, having to walk away from an art history career is no small matter. So that was kind of a scary thing for me. But I ultimately realized that I wasn't really walking away from it. I was just uh, building upon it. So I still yeah. do all the things that I do, except uh, that I did, except I don't have to, uh, yeah, immerse yeah. myself in dusty underground libraries a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And did it take a while for you to 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 make it a career, or was it just a, a gradual progression, or was there a point mm -hmm. where you said, you know what, I'm going to give up all that other stuff and I'm just going to concentrate on on photography and teaching? Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, well, kind of both of those things, but in two parts. So there was this agonizing long drift <laughs> going on yeah. as I was falling further in love with photography and uh, then there was that kind of going cold turkey moment when I finally said you know what this is really what I want to do and, uh, and it was just you know I was just putting it off for a long time yeah. and neglecting my career at, at the end when it, and when I finally realized what I was doing um I said, yeah, this this needs to stop. I need to yeah. just admit to myself that I must do this. I must yeah. you know, take up photography full time. Yeah, and, and, and if you don't mind me asking, how old were you then when you decide, decided that you were going to do it full time? Uh, I was in my mid-30s. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, not, uh, you know, not really um, young, but <laughs> young yeah. enough yeah. to make the jump. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, well, I think that's the thing because I, I know, especially here in Australia, to make a living from photography, it's it's quite challenging, and there's only there's not that many people that can do it successfully. And it's always interesting to hear people's stories and and hear about how they how they got into it, and how they transitioned from you know part time hobbyist to to full time professional. And um, yeah, it's it's a, it's a difficult thing. And I I know a lot of really great photographers over here that still have second jobs to to ch sort of you know make ends meet and and pay the bills. So yeah, it's it's, it's yeah. good to see. Yeah, I mean, I did have this period when I was moonlighting as an assignment photographer. So I was a working photographer for, for a while. And, you know, so I, I had at least that income. I had a, a pretty good stock catalog that, that and this was back in the days when that actually was a source of income <laughs> for <laughs> photographers. Yeah. Before yeah. I, I <laughs> Start but it, it was still scary, yeah, you know, just to say, okay. And the reason that I kind of was emboldened enough to do it was that I was getting a lot of requests for things that I was not offering. They were nowhere on my website listed as services, you know, workshops, um, processing instruction. I wasn't even offering that. All I was doing was the assignment work, and I, and I had a little niche um, that I was known in for that. But then when all this other stuff kept coming at me, I thought, you know what? Let's just throw caution to the wind here and see yeah, what happens. Give it a go. Have a crack. Yeah. And and you were living in America at that stage, I'm assuming? Yeah. 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 I mean, I've always, uh, since about 2004, I've split my time between Europe and the United States, but I've always had my main residence in the United States. And that's where my business is. I mean, that's really where I consider myself being from and living, but I yeah. do keep uh, a small office in Slovenia, um, which is very useful because I do so much work in Europe. Look, I was just going to ask you, talking about your photography, I'm looking at um, at one of your images uh, right now on Instagram. And look, if you're listening to this podcast, uh, just do a search for Erin Babnick. You, you're not going to re regret it. Now, the, the one I'm looking at is, um, it's called Flowers for Miles. Can I ask you, what's going on in your mind when you take a, a picture like that? Sure, yeah. I've actually written and spoken quite a lot about that approach to photography. I, it's not one that um, I <laughs> that is all that I do, but I think mm. I'm known for that kind of um, low-to-the-ground, um, what British photographers often call forced perspective, you know, the near-far thing. <laughs> um, but what I 
appreciate about that approach to composition is being able to give a more full picture of of the story um, by allowing people to sort of put together in their minds as viewers what I'm able to put together in my experience of being in a place. So kneeling down and appreciating what a flower looks like at my feet and also being able to understand it within its context and within, you know, that context of nature that I'm having an experience in. Um, that to me puts together a greater totality of the experience than what you can get out of say a 50 mil view or something that renders those, those flowers as little polka dots of color, you know, in the background, that's a whole different way of understanding the space. So that's what I think about. Yeah. Yeah. So going back uh, quite a few years now, you, you, I, I think I read somewhere where your, your father used to write, um, books on different yeah. subjects on, on was it computer or technical books and stuff yeah, like that yeah in the end he started out as a novelist and in the end uh, that's what he took up was I, gosh i don't know you you you've done some great research i don't know where you found that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah and i used to actually help him with with some of his books by illustrating them for him using computer graphics to um to show people how um, the the software would work, I would have to use the software to create mm. pictures. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, in I, mean, I think that's fantastic working with uh, with their father like that. And I mean, I've got a young daughter. I'm, I'm just hoping that one day she will want to work with me on a project or do something like that. But I, I, I read that um, that's how you learned Photoshop. Is that right? When um, doing, yeah. doing, working on a book for your dad, so you started. Uh, well, actually, not quite. Um, Photoshop was introduced to me by some Adobe representatives while I was working at a newspaper as a graphic artist. Mm. Okay, uh, yep. it was called Digital Darkroom, or at least one of the 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 uh, programs that got folded into Photoshop when it was created. Uh, mm. So we were using Digital Darkroom, and one day uh, the manager of the department said, all right, we've got some people coming in from this company called Adobe, and they, they just bought this thing, and they made something else. We're going to start using that, and they're going to show you how to use it. <laughs> so yeah, it was yeah. the very yeah. first version, or probably a beta version, that they were teaching us on. That's <clears throat> and it was the first newspaper in the United States to employ digital, uh, a major new p- newspaper to employ digital development and its and its uh, production yeah that's amazing and and did you ever have you ever met thomas knoll no <laughs> i haven't oh. but his, his name yeah. is there is number one i, I don't know what pr- uh, program it was uh but i don't think it was digital darkroom that he had developed but some other uh, that i think that i could be wrong that yeah. he probably developed and then that was one of the others that got kind of bought up and folded mm-hmm. into photoshop yeah, you know, I've, I've I've met Thomas, um, you know, Thomas Noel on a, on a trip, so um, it was it was one of those moments where, you know, you know this guy, you've you've heard of this bloke, and you, and when you open up Photoshop, you know his name's there at the top of the list mm-hmm. of all those people, and, and uh, I remember um, meeting him for the first time and and you know expecting to have this riveting conversation and that he would be interested in you know some some schmuck from uh from Western <laughs> Australia and and, um, and and just saying oh, hi thomas oh, yeah, lovely to meet you blah 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 and got a oh, yeah, hello yes shook my hand and and that was it, it was like a it was an empty book <laughs> and I was oh, like, dear. oh no oh <laughs> Not make a conversation. I was nervous. I, I don't think he was interested, or or maybe uh, not. Uh, yeah. Anyway, it was hilarious. So we were on this workshop, and and um, uh, we were on this boat, and I had to do a demonstration for. It was a workshop. It was a, there was thirty six people. It was it was a Podas. Have you heard of the Podas workshops? I have not. Like the Phase One Digital Art Series. Workshops. Oh, okay. It's no. Uh, yeah, I was doing one of those, and and Thomas Noel was on the boat. He was one of the guests, um, along with you know Art, you, you know Art Wolf, um, uh-huh. Art Wolf, yeah, was one of the other instructors, and and Kevin Raber. I'm not sure if you've met Kevin. I haven't. Uh, yeah, um, and Michael Reichman. Anyway, I'm on this boat doing a uh, a talk on Photoshop to the guy who invented Photoshop. Wow. And it was it was the toughest toughest gig <laughs> I've ever ever had to do. And and the worst thing is we were on this boat and it was rough as guts. And the boat was rocking around and it was getting late. My my uh, talk was supposed to start just after Thomas had a bit of a talk about how him and his brother did the visual effects for Star Wars. 
So I, I was already on the back foot because everyone was going, wow, man, this guy's invented, the, did the oh, visual effects of Star Wars, blah, 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 it's Photoshop, and, and the boat was rocking and people were getting seasick. And I was looked down, there was uh, Wolf sitting in the front row and he was asleep. <laughs> so that was... <laughs> Completely so I, I, you know, I'm really sucking, and um, and and then I started doing my talk, and I was talking about how to um, uh, make selections using um, channels. And anyway, um, uh, Thomas Knoll was at the back back of the room laughing with Kevin Ray, but having a good old laugh. And and um, so I just thought, right, I'm going to ask them. I said, "What's so funny, guys?" And they said, "Oh, Thomas goes, uh, uh, Christian, you know, you're, you're just uh, demonstrating a, a, a technique that we put in Photoshop back in 1983." <laughs> 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 <Thanks. laughs> so yeah, so uh, that's why I wanted to ask the question if you've ever met met him, and um, but um, no, you, you haven't. So uh, funny. Anyway, these things happen, and, and and I'm sure you've done plenty of workshops in front of people that um, uh, uh, big names and and uh, and all that sort of stuff. It's always a bit intimidating. I don't know how you feel. Have you been teaching forever? Have you, is it something that you've always done? Well, I've been yes. <laughs> I've always been a teacher of some sort, but workshops uh, only for about five years now. Yeah, I mean yeah. photography workshops, yeah. but you know before that I was an art historian and I taught computer graphics before I taught Photoshop for many years. Um, that's all in my distant past. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, yeah. So so now, I mean, one thing I've really noticed about your work, um, it's it's there's predominantly beautiful scenic locations that you go to. Mm. Um, and I was just wanting to find out, did, have you ever had any interest in, in the more urban scenes and more banal sort of stuff like oh, that? Yeah. Or was it... <clears throat> I, I've, I've taken most of that down off of my website because I don't think it's representative of what I'm currently interested in. But that's where I started. I was yeah. uh, really – I mean, after I went through my macro phase, I don't know if everybody goes through that. Mm. But, <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. started there. But after that, I got really into ruins because I was uh, my specialty as an art historian w- was the ancient world, um, classical Greece and Rome. So I was photographing ruins and I just kind of transferred that into the mountains and I started photographing old castles and uh, World War One bunkers and I would take yeah. strobe yeah. lights out there and gel them and light them up. And uh, yeah. 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 And I did a lot of travel photography too. That was, um, it was apparent to me early on that that was going to be a good way to develop a stock portfolio. So I put uh, quite an emphasis on that. And I was right. It worked out quite well until it didn't. (laughs) And Microsoft swallowed up the world of licensing. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so does that that work? Can you see that work anywhere? Or is it because I noticed on your website that, that I couldn't find anything like that. So is that stuff that you just, just keep for yourself now or do you do you not yeah I actually i don't really have that on uh, much of it on there might be one or two left on my website somewhere um mm. but yeah i do still have that portfolio of imagery i just don't see see it sort of um meshing well with where yeah. the, the turn i took later yeah. on yep. i'm sure i'll get back to it someday to me i i, I still appreciate travel photography and, and photography that involves more of, um, you know, man-made elements. Yeah. Yeah. And I yeah. am strongly opposed to the idea that there should be a conceptual division between man and nature. Um, so I don't, I don't want to suggest through my work that I think that, you know, one is opposed to the other. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just not what interests me right now. I enjoy the challenge of working um, without the, the man-made elements in them, because to me that was actually kind of low-hanging fruit. I I felt for me like that. I just I developed kind of patterns, mm, and I wanted yeah. to get out of it and try something uh, that was more challenging for me. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And 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 um, so because you you photograph a lot of this beautiful nature scenes. Are you an environmentalist yourself? Do you do you, do you feel strongly about the way we're yeah, the world's going and the way we treat the planet is that something that- absolutely it's something that i talk and write about quite a bit although i i wouldn't say that uh, i you know I'm, I'm wary of these terms environmentalist and mm. and whatnot in, in terms of that sounding like i'm some kind of activist or something but um not that that's a bad thing but yeah. um you know that i have 
but I do have very strong thoughts about it. I'm actually the article that I'm writing right now is uh, uh, founded on um, sort of some environmentalist issues. Um, but yeah, I take it very seriously. Uh, I I have pretty strong thoughts about it for sure. Yeah, and and I guess with the, with the work you've done and the traveling you've done. Have you noticed much much change in the landscape that you're photographing over the years? Absolutely, yeah. This is something that I've talked about quite a lot, especially in the Dolomites. And then, and then we're not talking about a huge amount of time there, but mm. a decade since I first started going. Wow. Um, mm. And it has changed utterly. Uh, now I go to places that I thought I knew well, and they no longer have you know flowers that I used to find there. They now have garbage all over the place. Um, you know, just all sorts of really sad developments that yeah. in some way I, I kind of, you know, I have this sense of guilt about because I know yeah. that I played some role in helping to popularize uh, a lot of these areas. And, and so I do have those conflicted feelings that I think a lot of photographers do about yeah. exposing some of these areas that uh, we love so much <laughs> to yeah. greater visitation by people who may not have the education to work on preserving them. When you mentioned the, the Dolomites have changed in a decade, what specifically have you noticed? Edelweiss missing where it used to be pretty regularly. Um, big patches of flowers um, gone where tents mm. were put on top of them. Yeah, right. You know, they probably won't grow again. Um, and as I said, areas where uh, it used to feel really pristine and now there's just toilet paper behind every rock. And um, yeah, I, and also, you know, you'll go to places that I'll go to places where I used to not to find people. And now there are all a whole bunch of tents pitched there illegally. And, and you know, it's the whole different, it's like a... A Disneyland of you know frisbees and dogs and tents and it's just yeah. it's a different place. Oh, no. <laughs> as as a landscape photographer, how do you um, handle y yourself as a as a citizen of the world? I guess you know it's rubbish in, rubbish out. But do you when you see these sort of situations like you know people pitching tents and rubbish and that sort of stuff? Do you are you ever tempted just to say you know come on guys, you know? Oh yeah, I go up to people and confront them sometimes, um, and that doesn't usually turn out very well. Mm. Um, I also do Instagram stories, um, not infrequently, um, sort of shaming people. <laughs> I mean, not you know, like I mean, I'm 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 kind of kind about it, um, and my fangs aren't that sharp. But you know, I I. Uh, recently, for example, I was teaching a workshop in the French Alps and came across a tent about, oh, three meters at most away from a stream and on top of a patch of wildflowers. Those are two big no-nos right Fan there. Fantastic. And in an area where tents are illegal. <laughs> and there were two of them and there was a dog and they had wow. their, their uh, cooking stuff out. And this was mm -hmm. early in the morning. We'd come out to photograph sunrise in this area. Um, and, uh, so I, they were still asleep in their tents and I just took out my phone and, uh, did a little, uh, Instagram story about this is not, not okay. No, not okay. <laughs> so those yeah, people in the tents that's... never knew I did that and yeah. nobody on Instagram will ever know who they were because I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, at least I was showing people this is, this, this is wrong. And, and I was surprised that the most common response that I got when people messaged me written in, in after seeing that was why not uh, i'd said you know by water is wrong on top of wildflowers is wrong they got the wildflowers thing most of them were like why not why not by water you know they honestly didn't you're kidding, know you're kidding so <clears throat> you yeah. know I, I i see my role as being one of education primarily not really to shame people that's not what i'm trying to do in your workshops do you do you share that message with the uh, participants that you, you know, in your, in your workshop? Absolutely. They all have to sit through a big leave no trace uh, section in my orientation. My orientations are all uh, quite formal in a conference room mm. with a projector and screen and all of that. And mm. I go through a whole bit on that. Um, and I think that it is eye opening to a lot of them a lot of people who are in the workshops. And I think that that's one of the really um, useful and beautiful things about working with people in person is that you have that opportunity to frame your, your um, entrance into the wilderness 
through, you know, these thoughts that you have about it and the, mm -hmm. the sorts of ideas that these people can take forward that can make them really understand it, care about it, and also have, um, you know, just the basic information about what sorts of things can be damaging to it. Yeah. And, and look, everyone that takes photographs, you know, the, you go out to photograph this location, you see these these hero spots, these these iconic shots, and you, and they're almost like a trophy. It's like going to Africa, and yep. you've got to get a photograph of a, an elephant or a lion, or if mm -hmm. if you're a hunter, you've got to you've got to kill that 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 wild animal that just that that trophy. And and yeah. you see that a lot with photography, and 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 more so recently. Look, I was in America twenty years ago, and that was back before everyone was using anyone was using digital and. Um, there was hardly anyone. I went to all those iconic places, and I was I was very rarely was there many more than one or two other photographers there. And you know, I'm talking arches and and all these places, Zion, Canyonlands, all these all these iconic spots. And I was getting all my shots. But you go back there now, and they're they're just crowded. And there's people everywhere. Iceland is overrun with 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 photographers. And um, yeah, it's we are you know, as a group of tourists we are probably some of the worst and i know here in australia we have a place called Karajini national park and there's signs that say do not go past this this area and mainly it's for your safety so don't fall into a gorge and die <laughs> but, but people photographers especially will just avoid that because they know there's a there's this hero shot or a shot that you've got to have and, and that that really frustrates me a lot with photography and photographers just their attitudes i think um yeah, it's sort of some way, and 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 you, and you hit the nail on the head. It's all about education. I think if people are educated, then they're more less likely to do these things. Um, but yeah, it's yep, it's a it's a worry. It. Yeah, but that that is the solution in my view. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. not penalising; it's educating. Landscape photography has massively taken off. Uh, shooting in Perth, uh, down at South Perth, which is um, a, a city view. You go down there at five o'clock in the morning. There's there's about twenty people with with cameras. Um, so it's just the, the craft as a whole is just going off. But what I noticed is um, most of the shooters, well, they're mostly male. I actually tried to do some research on what, are there any really hard numbers about this matter? And I asked a bunch of my friends to look up their Facebook analytics to see, um, it, it'll say there, the gender breakdown of your followers. And um, everyone who reported back, uh, almost across the board uh, did say that they had something like, a, you know, it was about two thirds usually uh, male followers with some exceptions. Mm -hmm. The really good looking mm -hmm. guys had a lot more women. We actually, would know. The one person. <laughs> sorry. Ninety percent. I think I'm, I'm following him. <laughs> No, there was there was one I think one person who had more women and it was a guy, um, yeah, but <laughs> good so on what him. you think of that I don't know. <laughs> but, um, it's actually interesting. Um, I, look, I've done I've been doing workshops here for ten years, and I think here you know what I've found. I mean, it is kind of male dominated in some ways, but. I think part of that is because um, girls are more fearful for their security when they're out on their own photographing landscapes, and and it shouldn't be that way. But it's just it's just what it is. People, uh, you know, women uh, have to face that, and and that they have to think to themselves, how am I going to be safe if I go out at night time or in the dark to mm. photograph these remote locations? Um, so, but look, um, as far as my workshops go, I'm, I'm I reckon I get about. Forty percent women to to the sixty percent men, so mm. it's it's not too bad. But yeah, it, it's definitely um, male dominated. But one thing I have to say though, the women are always more creative than the men. I've always found that. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> you'd have to agree with me, wouldn't you? Oh uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't really notice a difference. To be honest, well, controversial. <laughs> can, can I? I have on the topic of safety, I just have to say, I, I feel to some extent, especially with regards to the wilderness, that that notion might be more socially constructed than true. Um, I feel safer in the wilderness than I do anywhere else, because the most threatening creature to me is the two-legged variety, I think. And so if I'm not near humanity <laughs> um i don't worry about that so much really you know i spend a lot of time out in the wilderness on my own um and you know it, 
what's going on in my head uh, there is quite different from what used to be the case when I did more uh, photography in civilized areas. Oh, actually, Aaron, I think you need to um, watch Wolf Creek, uh, which is a good good <laughs> no, Aussie. Don't um, listen to him. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, no. you might change your mind. Australia's a Australia's a strange place. We have mm. we have all these things that happen out in the outback in the remote wilderness regions. It's yeah, but it's you, pretty but crazy right. critters too. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got uh, we've got a few killers, but but nothing like what you have over in America. Uh-huh. I have to say, I started shooting at Yena Bay in Sydney, and I've been there at four thirty in the morning in the car park. Now, Yena Yena Bay is in uh, Botany National Park in the Shire, and you know you, you're cautious about other cars in the car park, and it can be kind of scary. And I suppose uh, that environment could be off-putting for women, and obviously some blokes. And is that the reason? Is that why? Why aren't there more women in landscape photography? Yeah. I- I'm glad I appreciate you asking that question because I don't think it is because of being afraid of being outdoors or any of these kind of (laughs) really easy to pin down ideas or, you know, it's not that easy to explain. I think it's actually far more socially related. um, And I have a lot of answers to it. One of them being quite actually quite simple, which is that being that uh, men uh, do seem to dominate. There do seem to be more of them, or, and it, it certainly was the case historically. Um, at the beginnings of photography, absolutely this was the case. And so what you have is a perpetuating situation where uh, it's easy for men to mentor each other, to interact with each other, to promote each other, to um, I- engage in a way that helps them to uh, advance. And women don't have as much access to that world for a lot of socially important reasons. Mm. Um, for example, <clears throat> uh, and Carwin and I just had a discussion about this yesterday, mm. but um, I-, I think that I am kind of the exception that proves the rule in that I have I enjoy a very successful career uh, as a woman landscape photographer um, and there are very 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 few of us so even if you might say that there are a lot of women who enjoy landscape photography who might take a workshop might enjoy going out with their cameras those who actually rise to the level of having any kind of professional prominence are indeed few and far between and that is because to break through into those levels of of any um, profession uh, you need to reach a certain level of the craft, and you also need to have a, a certain ability to network. Um, but let's just take the first one, just getting good at what you do. Uh, I learned a lot just by having a, a lot of guy friends and learning from them. And I, uh, I from what they say, it went both ways. <laughs> you know, I, I was, I was teaching them as well. But just having that kind of access to them required me to to have a kind of an open mind about hanging out with guys a lot. I was brought up uh, by my father and had brothers, so I'm very comfortable around men, and that was easy for me to do. I don't have the inhibitions, perhaps, that maybe some women do. Um, mm-hmm. I also didn't have, say, a, uh, a boyfriend or a husband saying I shouldn't be doing these things. And that's yeah. another thing that's a tricky area. So you've got this whole issue of what is co- socially acceptable mm-hmm. that is in some ways holding some women back and also holding men back from bringing them into the fold. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're, if you're, let's say, uh, you know, a married man and you want to go out on a photography trip and uh, you want to bring a buddy along, uh, are you going to first turn to another guy or let's say there's a married woman <laughs> who you know is a particularly good photographer, you know, who do you think it's going to be okay to ask along? And these, these <laughs> well, are not with... <laughs> trivial matters. You know, that's how you, yeah. how we mentor each other and how, as photographers and how we learn. And I suppose that um, mm-hmm. that attitude too is compounded by, um, you know, the vice president of the United States, Mike Pence, um, you know, refusing to, to break bread with another female unless his wife's actually pre- uh, uh, present. So yep. uh, maybe that there is that, you know, sort of prevailing attitude of, oh, for sure. you know, ha- how, does, yeah, how does and, it look? And in many, many cultures, you know, that that's uh, a lot of people take a dim view to uh, – to women and men fraternizing if it's not in some kind of romantic context. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, another story I was telling Carwin yesterday was what, uh, I'm a member of <clears throat> Photocascadia. We're a team of seven nature photographers, a collective. 
Uh, we basically do a bunch of um, educational projects together. And I think you're the only lady, and by the looks of it. For I'm the discussion. only woman in the group, yes. And yeah. uh, when we travel, it's always an issue of who gets stuck having to share a room with me. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a thing. Like, they have to draw the short straw. Who gets stuck with the woman? And then whoever does, you know, has to call the wife saying, Look, honey, just so you know, uh, there are two rooms in the in the hotel, two beds in the hotel room. But, you know, and, you know, those are the other decisions that that can can make have an effect on who fraternizes with whom. So, again, go back to that scenario. Who are you going to invite along on your trip or who are you going to work with as a workshop partner? Do you have to budget for two hotel rooms when you could just have one? Um, Do you have to, if you're going backpacking somewhere, could you just carry a single tent? Would that enable you to carry more camera equipment if two guys can stuff together in one tent? Is What if it's a woman? Now, let's not bring her along. That complicates everything, you know. You have to carry more you know, stuff. That's so, it's so true. That is so true. I've never even thought about that, but you know that that does make a huge difference, and I can I can see how that affects you know, people's attitudes and and their their decision making when it comes to these things. So yeah, yeah. Wow. Thanks for enlightening us on that. What can we do to uh, get more women into landscape photography? Now I, I know that you've got a private group on Facebook called uh, Sheep's uh, Sheescapes. Can you can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, the, the whole idea there was to give women access to each other, at least, as a means of mentorship, so that we can get more women up to that level where they can be considered for those higher professional um, goals, <laughs> um, or, or even just, you know, uh, to to improve their own craft and not necessarily, in a, it's not really all about professionalism. In fact, it's not at all. But yeah, so it's a group where anyone in the group can invite other women to join. That way, um, everyone who's in the group is for sure a woman. <laughs> That's the idea, <laughs> at least. Uh, um, so, uh, and and to give women a place to kind of um, not feel as though they're they're necessarily being um, scrutinized by men uh, in being able to reach out to each other and. Uh, and so far, I think it's been pretty helpful. Uh, so the women in there um, have a place to interact and to connect and to meet up. And, and a lot of the questions that do come up are, are of more of a, a professional nature. So mm. I, I, there are over 400 women in the group right now. And uh, it's only, I, I think, three years old maybe now. But um, hopefully it, it'll have some long-term knock-on effect. Would, would you be happy to um, have some Australians joining the group as well? Oh, I do have some. I, I actually just added one recently. She was a participant on a workshop that I had two weeks ago, and uh, she's my newest addition is an Australian. <laughs> yeah. Great. How, how do they find They're you? from all over the world. How do they yeah. find Sheescapes? Yeah. Just do a search on, on Facebook? or? Uh, uh, yeah, so that that's the tricky part. I'm mm. not sure how else to do that to make it, um, uh, to make it so that Women can can find it, and and yet men can't infiltrate. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> not, not that it's meant to be exclusionary, but that is kind of the premise: is that it should be this place where um, uh, women can mentor each other in an uncomplicated fashion. Yeah. Um, uh, Carmen and I have already got a uh, our own website. It's called Manscaping. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, we we. Um, yeah, but that's it's definitely a man only sort yeah, of thing. It's very, so, yeah. very manly, manly <laughs> stuff. Aaron, can we ask you a um, a small favour? Every week we ask the um, the listeners to send us their images just so we can have a chat about them and maybe give them some uh, constructive feedback. Would you be kind enough to have a look at this image uh, that Joy Kachina from Tasmania sent in? I, I just sent it through to you a second ago. Um, would you be kind enough to have a look at that and maybe give us you some bet. feedback? Now, we, um, we don't know a lot about Joy. She reached out to us on Instagram and sent us this picture, and we're going to put it up on our Instagram in a sec. Um, and if you'd like to send us one of your photos so we can have a chat about it, just send it through to lightminded617 at gmail.com. Now, Erin, what do you think about this seascape? Um, well, you know, I um, there are a number of things that I, that I definitely appreciate about it, appreciate about it uh, for starters. Um, I, I sort of enjoy how it's, it sort of sets up this kind of dialogue between that little pocket of light, what looks to be illuminated rocks or sort of, they're different from all the others, the green ones, um, and that illuminated bit in the sky. Uh, for me, it sort of sets up this sort of dialogue between those two. Um, 
and in a, a beautiful color of green rocks. I'm not really sure why that would be. Perhaps it's just the pool of water itself creating that color. But um, what I what I think would perhaps make this image um, even more powerful for me would be a little bit more of a payoff there in, in setting up that <laughs> comparison. And I think maybe that could have could be helped with some post-processing fixes actually uh, for me the colors are pulling apart a little bit in the in the lower half in the sky and the way that the bright areas of the sky are handled they're kind of clipping and that sort of thing mm. um, takes away from the cohesion between the two parts and also takes away a bit from the naturalism of the sky um, so I, li I like the direction that it's going in if I were if it were my image um, I'd probably want to maybe get in a little bit closer to that green area mm -hmm. and to set up even more of a, a connection between it and what we find in the distance, perhaps through some color work and also through some tonal work to make that that bright area in the sky um, not look so kind of digi clipped and unnatural. Yeah, I, I agree. I, and I was listening to uh, uh, one of your other podcasts actually today about. Um, your color theory and and how you like to um, you know the different things that you do to to make this color harmony in in your photographs and and um, definitely do, like you're saying the colors are pulling apart a little bit there and uh, maybe with some hue shifts that could uh, that could be brought into line a little bit and maybe uh, bringing down some of those stronger colors that are, are sort of uh, pulling a little bit um, that would help but yeah yeah um, good comments I think that's great feedback for for joy so do you reckon uh, Aaron with that shot would you have gotten closer to that pool like you've got that sort of low style do you reckon you would have got got down a little bit lower there well it's, it depends I mean sometimes when you do that you lose your background so it's mm. hard to say uh, I do okay. feel as though there's a, a there's a lot of all of those rocks in the front are just one more thing and they're kind of bright and I feel like I kind of want to walk in front of them a little bit mm, I do yeah. get get that sensation um, yeah. but that's you know again kind of not the primary um sort of hang up that i have <laughs> with the whole you know that to me composition is always the hardest thing to talk about and it's the hardest thing to teach um so you know just in with you how how do you um uh, decide where to point your camera. Is, is there a certain mm. compositional tools that and, and ideas that you have in your head when you're out shooting, or do you just see it and feel it? Is it just come natural to you? Um, it's hard for me to divorce my approach to com uh, composition from the sensibilities that I developed as an art historian specializing in ancient Greek sculpture. To me, everything's this is a monument. <laughs> so yeah, I even, yeah. you know, I see mountains as abstract sculptures in a landscape. I see features of the landscape in dialogue with, you, with each other, like sculptural groups. Um, I've written a lot about this. I have two articles on compositional patterns, one that addresses a sort of hierarchical grand landscape scheme where you have, the, you know, the the thing <laughs> that yeah. that uh, sort of pins down the whole image. And then the other, the other, which tends to be more the case with abstracts, um, where you have patterns that uh, actually in many cases work because there isn't the thing. You know? yeah. So I, I have two different kind of ways of thinking about um, composition. And in, in that in that one main one that I use for uh, grand landscapes, it is what, what essentially, if I could really break it down, is like an idea of hierarchy. What is sort of the monument and how do I put everything kind of in dialogue with it or set up some kind of story there between the elements and put them all in support of of the thing and I resist yeah. using the word subject for a lot of reasons but it's essentially yeah. that yeah for sure um it, it, there must be a, a sense though that you you feel it's right when you're looking to the viewfinder do you kind of naturally go you know you're just looking through and you're, you're moving your viewpoint a little bit you're going up and down is there a point where you go oh, I felt that that's that's the spot do you think that's that, well, that sometimes, could be taught or a lot of the time yeah um I love that feeling um, other times, um, this is a big part of my, my composition talk that I've been on tour with for several years, but, you know, a lot of times I've got sort of these grand forms of, of, of an almost composition. And if I have something moving, um, like clouds or water, um, atmosphere or something like that, I'll just sit there and the composition comes to me, mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't quite know what it is I'm waiting for, but I'll know it when I see it and it just buttons up the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
yeah yeah for sure yeah no i think and, and, and a lot of it is just having spending that time looking and and i've done some some painting and some drawing and drawing classes and painting classes and, and my my uh teacher would always say you know drawing is and painting is 90 percent looking and 10 percent doing mm. and i think with photography you tend to get out of the car turn on the camera point it at something and just start blasting away whereas definitely if we had all that in the back of their mind i'm just going to keep the camera in the bag until i find something that that's worthwhile then i'll pull it out and take the photograph that's that's probably something that we could all learn from and and i definitely know for me when i first started out i was using a fuji jig 617 uh, with velvia and every time i pushed the button it cost me five bucks mm. and you know, i was washing dishes <laughs> you know i was washing dishes at the time mm. making 10 bucks an hour mm. so i had no money so it was like okay I'm not going to take a photo unless it's right. So I would I would be able to take the little viewfinder off the top of that camera and just walk around with that and, and just look up through there and just try and find the composition that, that I thought worked. That was worth, you know, that was worth five bucks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And that, I think that taught me a lot. And I spent years doing that and not, um, um, yeah, not wasting film. So that, that's a problem with digital and, and, the benefit I see with digital and the problem with digital is that it's too easy just to go, look, it's, oh, I don't think it's right, but I'm going to shoot it anyway because you just never know. And and I think that's that's a hard one. But the beauty is obviously you get instant feedback. But but how often do you see things on the back of your little screen on your camera and then get it back onto the bigger screen on your computer and it just doesn't work like you thought yeah. it had? So that, no, it definitely does for me anyway. So I, I feel that too. So. Yeah. Another related um, issue with with digital that since you brought that up, um, it, I think that a lot of tra- the trap that a lot of people fall into is not only this feeling that because you can take lots of, lots of pictures that you should, mm. but also the feeling that social media has kind of instilled in people that you must that you you know mm-hmm. that it has to be quantity all the time. You know, you need to yeah. stay relevant, you need to stay visible, to keep mm. like a little hamster on the wheel, keep running on yeah. that <laughs> treadmill and pumping stuff out, and so. I definitely see this mentality in a lot of people that, um, it, you know, they just need to shoot a lot of stuff because they need content. You know, where, yeah. even if they're not even professionals, they have this mentality. <laughs> yeah. so, just uh, my next question was in the age of social media, how do you feel any pressure? Do you feel any pressure to photograph a subject for your fans? And I think you've just That's answered great. that there where, sure. where, yeah, you don't. And I noticed on your Instagram feed and, on your Facebook page, you don't have huge amounts of photos, but what you have is brilliant and it's, and it's, oh, it's thank you. You know, awe-inspiring. Yeah, I think I have about 35 pictures that I've ever posted yeah. to Instagram and how exactly. it is that I managed to survive <laughs> as a yeah, professional yeah. is probably some kind of miracle. But <laughs> Yeah, well, um, I think yeah. It's, it's good, it's good. And one thing I learned in, in my early days going back oh, when I started not 29 years ago, I remember... I had my first um, meeting with a with an advertising agency. I was doing commercial work at the time, and they said, "Look, can we just have a look at some of your work so um, we can get a gauge of you know, who you are?" And I took down it was all transparencies in those days. So I had all these trannies in these nice little plastic portfolios and a light box, and I took down everything I had. And the guy said to me after he said, "Look, you know, you got some beautiful photos there, but you got some others there that you shouldn't show anyone." And, and he's, <laughs> Yeah, you know, definitely. Said, only show people your best work, yeah. and and that's so yeah. important. And you know, and, and it's not just perception; it's also for yourself. You know, if, how do you decide who you are as an artist if you never make those sort of? If you're not your own best curator, you know, yeah. um, you have to make those decisions for yourself. And and being critical uh, helps a lot. Just deciding yeah. what am I actually going to put out there—the stuff that is actually me. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, and and look, I I think it is there is that pressure from in social media, and actually, I've just noticed on Instagram, um, just came through as I was sitting down waiting for my Japanese takeaway, wondering whether I was going to get home in time for this podcast. Um, Instagram have taken off the the likes on the on the post now, so you see. Oh, I heard post. about that. Has that finally happened? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's happened. So now now you can't see how many likes. I think you can go into your insights and see it personally yourself. But no one else can see how many people, other people, have liked your uh, your images. Oh, I think and, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yep, yeah. Where, where to now for Erin Bobnick? 
Uh, well, I am currently uh, working on, uh, as I said, an article in my office. <laughs> so I'm not going anywhere anytime soon until mid-August. Uh, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I have um, uh, a speaking engagement in Arizona. So I'll be back in the United States for that. Mm-hmm. And uh, then uh, a whole lot more time on the road. I've got um, a workshop coming up in Death Valley after that. And then it's back to Europe for more. So, uh, oh, I also have in October two other speaking engagements, but both in the United States, one in um, Oregon and another in the Bay Area. That's mm-hmm. kind of the the rhythm of my life is workshops and speaking engagements. Yeah, <laughs> so I, yeah. I'm on the road about 300 days a year. Um, wow. for those reasons and for also just exploring areas for um, uh, various variety of purposes. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Sure. I, mean, I envy you be, being able to um, have that freedom to, to be able to pursue you know, the, your passion and be able to do that sort of stuff. It's, it's really great. Have you ever thought about having a gallery? Absolutely. In fact, um, I had been setting up for precisely those sorts of things to, to do. I actually, you know, this is not sustainable, to be completely honest. The life that I have traveling this much isn't really by design. It's just sort of how, how things are for me. Um, and I'm, I'm, it's one of the problems that I've been trying to solve. I had set up a, a wonderful house in California uh, with each room dedicated to a different purpose, one of them being printing. Uh, and Canon had set me up with a wonderful printer, and I was going to get more into um, working towards having a gallery. I, I would love to do that someday, and, and putting more effort into the printing end of things, which is very hard to do when you're on the road all the time. Mm-hmm. Having inventory and just the whole thing becomes very almost impossible. I also want to write books and uh, produce more uh, educational videos and uh, and all of that, and. Uh, that will take me off the road. Uh, that's the idea anyway. <laughs> you touched on your home in California. Uh, unfortunately, you were caught up in the uh, the wildfires there. Look, you just lost everything. Yeah, that's the other part of that. That house lasted one week. <laughs> so that whole, that whole plan in, got incinerated as soon as I got it all set up. So I'm, I'm not only at square one, I'm quite a bit back from that negative something. <laughs> Oh, uh, but man, I'm working terrible. towards getting that back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and when was that? What, what year was that? That was this 2018. That, those are the fires of uh, November in uh, Paradise. I was in Paradise, California. I just moved into this house one week before the fire, and then it, it burned up everything Tragic. in the house wow. and my, my like, office and, and everything. You printer the can and gave me that whole thing. Poof, up in just, flames. Just <laughs> all completely gone. Just it's devastating. Yeah. Cameras, that sort of stuff as well? Uh, actually, um, some lenses went, but mostly I did, the, of all the stuff I grabbed, it was my camera bag, my laptop, and I, I left with the clothes in my bag and, you know, my gear. For a photographer. <laughs> just grabs a camera. Oh, Everything my. else can get stuffed. Values. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just take the important stuff. Actually, I've got a bit of old, I've got a bit of old camera gear. Uh, I, I would have left all my camera gear behind because it's all <laughs> that will need to be an upgrade. <laughs> Aaron, look, th- yeah. thanks very much for um, for joining us on the podcast. Would you would you consider coming back and having another chat with us at some stage? Absolutely, it'd be a pleasure. Yeah, you've got lots to, lots to share, and um, it's it's so nice to talk to you and 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 learn a bit more about who you are and and what you do, and um, hopefully a lot of the Aussies out there will be able to. Um, uh, follow you now and uh, get on some of your workshops. So where's the best place for them to actually do that? Mm. Uh, my website, AaronBobnick.com. You can also find me on photocascadia.com. That's uh, the collective that I mentioned previously. But uh, yeah, I mean, thanks very much for a great conversation and, and for your interest and support. I really appreciate it. Oh, no, it's, it's great. It's our, our pleasure yeah. and, and it's our privilege to have you on. So yeah, so um, yeah, thank you again. And thanks back at Jeff. <laughs>